Greetings. Thank you for all, come, all of you for coming today to um, listen to Jeanette Carrick defend her thesis. Um, uh, this is a packed crowd. Um, I know that you'll be consuming a lot of oxygen listening to her exciting results, but perhaps that's uh, appropriate considering that Jeanette has lived in the world of uh, anaerobes, uh, organisms that can survive in the absence of oxygen. Um, I thought that um, it would be great to frame the journey uh, that uh, Jeanette has made uh, to this point, uh, and with help from her family, we're really thrilled to have here to celebrate this day as well as uh, other members of her um, uh, connected family who are listening in, hopefully, um, through video cast. Um, um, so I want to uh, thank Jeanette's mom um, and uh, her life partner, uh, Ian, for assembling uh, this documentary, which will take the next 45 minutes to go through. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, what does it take um, to have the courage, the commitment, and the intelligence uh, to tackle a very complex problem. Uh, well, we have some clues early on uh, in this archival set of documents, um, starting out with the life of Jeanette Gehring by Jenny Writes a Lot. Um, so uh, Jeanette's uh, interest in the developing gut microbiota began uh, through personal experience uh, early in life. It looks like that experience was very happy um, and propelled her forward. Um, uh, uh, her commitment to scholarship was evident um, early on, as was her commitment to helping others. And I think that's really an important feature of Jeanette, the combination of wonderful intelligence, kindness, and generosity. So for those of you who can't read the uh, um, writing in number two leaded pencil, um, it says, I help the community by studying. <laughs> uh, uh, Another uh, comment uh, in this book was that I use bottles and water. <laughs> um, and uh, we have a picture uh, uh, that depicts her early love of science. Um, and science was her favorite subject in school. Uh, and we're told that she really likes to do experiments. Uh, and that when she was in early school, um, uh, she uh, performed an experiment in which she sought to understand the effects of mixing salt water and oil, crossing different disciplinary boundaries. Now, it's the first uh, evident that she had a project that delved deeply into the interaction between foods and the gut microbiota. And um, this interest in food uh, is manifest also in this legacy book. She, she knows she's a nice person because she has friends. And you are a very nice person, and you have many friends and admirers. Um, she exercises and eats pretty good foods to stay healthy. Um, she wanted to uh, continue her education, and she had this vision of what was going to come next um, after elementary school, junior high school, and high school. She wanted to go to college to learn how to write and draw better. California is where she wants to live, and in fact, that's where she's going to move after she finishes her PhD. Um, and she wants to live there because it would be a good spot to keep her horses. Um, now, there are many different obstacles experimentally that you have to overcome. Uh, uh, culturing fastidious anaerobes requires uh, her to work in um, plastic enclosed isolators. I guess this is an early example of what it would be like for biocontainment. Um, there is the need for inspiration as well as perspiration. And then finally, um, the courage to move forward and defend your ideas, your findings, others. And I guess this last image, as she's about ready to defend her thesis, is appropriate, but I don't think you're going to have to worry about people hurling objects uh, at your uh, mind or your body. But thank you very much for sharing this wonderful journey um, in the next hour. and thank you everyone for being here today. Uh, I'm excited to talk to you about my thesis project titled Microbiota Directed Therapeutic Foods for the Treatment of Childhood Undernutrition. Undernutrition is a serious global health problem. Worldwide, there are 
percent of children under five that have something called uh, wasting, which is which is when a child has a, a weight for height and Z score, um, many standard deviations below the mean. And, and so wasting is a measure of uh, being underweight for a child's height. So globally, there are about 50 million children that have wasting. Uh, and this is a, especially a critical problem in uh, Southern Asia, where 15.3% of children have wasting. And so when we look at all-cause child deaths, uh, undernutrition, some form of undernutrition, causes uh, up to 45% of child deaths. And children who survive periods of undernutrition often suffer long-term effects, such as immune dysfunction, stunting, and cognitive impairment. Um, the, so undernutrition is not caused by food security alone, but a range of host-related, environmental, and intergenerational factors. For example, decreased immune function, infection with enteric pathogens, and impaired absorption can all contribute to this cycle of undernutrition. So the focus of my project is on the gut, microbi the gut microbiota uh, because it interacts with many of these factors that contribute to this cycle of undernutrition. So my main hypothesis is that the healthy gut microbiota develops in a definable pattern over time that's similar across biologically unrelated children. And healthy development of the gut microbiota is linked to healthy growth. Uh, so for example, if a healthy child has a normal gut microbiota that develops properly, uh, this is associated with healthy growth and a mature microbiota that can perform functions necessary for that healthy growth. However, we had hypothesized that disruption of normal microbiota development is causally related to the pathogenesis of undernutrition. So if the normal process of microbiota development is disrupted, uh, this can lead to an immature microbiota, uh, which actually can contribute to the state of undernutrition and stunted growth. So my main question is, if we have a child with uh, an immature microbiota, is there a way we can shift this immature microbiota to a more mature state? And by doing that, uh, can we help rescue some of these growth deficits that we see in undernourished children? So first, in order to better understand the role the gut microbiota plays in undernutrition, we have to define what normal gut microbiota development looks like. So to do this, we started with a healthy birth cohort. Um, and these were children from an urban slum uh, called Mirpur in the capital city of Dhaka in Bangladesh. And, uh, and these children, um, we followed these children from birth to two years of life. Uh, collected fecal samples from these children every month, uh, and these children all had normal anthropometry. So anthropometry is a measure of uh, a child's weight and height. So these are healthy, normally developing children. And sampling, uh, having fecal samples from children every month throughout the first two years gave us a very high resolution view of how the microbiota is changing over time in these healthy children. So using a machine learning algorithm called random forests, we were able to identify bacterial taxa that are most discriminatory for different stages in the microbiota assembly. Uh, and random forests is able to tell us which particular bacterial taxa are the most age discriminatory. Uh, so these taxa are the taxa that are changing in relative abundance over time. And so, uh, so you can see here, I'm showing you these top 30 most age discriminatory taxa that were identified by the random forest model. And you can see um, along the x-axis, this is the, the age in months of, of these healthy children. Uh, and then the y-axis is all these different age discriminatory taxa. And you can see there's a definite progression over time. Uh, certain bacteria increase in abundance, certain bacteria decrease in abundance. Uh, so you can see the microbiota of children that are six months old uh, looks very different from the microbiota of children that are 24 months old. And so we call these bacterial taxa that are highly abundant early on in life um, as milk-associated age discriminatory taxa because they're associated with this exclusive breastfeeding period. And then we call the bacterial taxa that 
increase in relative abundance later on um, as weaning phase age discriminatory taxa because they increase in abundance as children are starting to eat complementary foods. And so next we wanted to ask if this model is generalizable to other healthy Bangladeshi children. So we built this model using 15 healthy <coughs> individuals. Uh, so we wanted to see if other healthy, if this model was able to accurately describe other healthy Bangladeshi children. And in fact, we see that when we apply this random forest based model to uh, a separate group of healthy Bangladeshi children that weren't used to build the model, we see a very strong correlation between the chronological age of the child and the microbiota age of the child. Uh, and so this microbiota age is what is predicted by the model. Um, so the model had no idea what the actual age of these children was, um, but just using the relative abundance of the bacteria in their microbiota, uh, the model was able to predict, um, give a very good and accurate prediction of the age of these children. And so it seems, at least in Bangladesh, there's this normal, uh, regular program of healthy microbiota assembly um, that is definable and that we can characterize. Uh, so next we wanted to see if the age discriminatory bacterial strains identified in this Mirapur birth cohort um, were shared by healthy members of birth cohorts in, in other regions in the world. And so we, uh, we had healthy birth cohorts from four other regions. And similar to Bangladesh, uh, these children were sampled monthly from birth to, to two years of age. And so, uh, so we had birth cohorts in India, South Africa, Brazil, and Peru. And surprisingly, we found that the resulting random forest models um, from all these different regions contained, sh contained uh, shared age discriminatory bacterial taxa. So there's a high degree of overlap in the bacterial taxa that are changing in abundance over time in these individuals. So there seems to be this shared program of microbiota assembly. Uh, and we can see this even further when we take the random forest derived model uh, built from individuals in one region and apply that model to fecal samples from children in a different region. And so here I've taken the random forest derived model from that was built from ch children in Bangladesh and applied it to healthy children in Peru. Uh, and similarly, when we take the, similar to when we apply the Bangladeshi model to Bangladeshi children, we see when we apply the Bangladeshi model to Peruvian children, there's a very strong correlation between chronological age and microbiota age. Um, and we see this with, all, with many different uh, reciprocal tests. So we always see this very strong correlation between the chronological age of the child and the predicted microbiota age of the child. Uh, so this is telling us, what this is telling us is that no matter where you look, um, there's this definable program of healthy microbiota development in healthy children. Uh, so, so children have, um, so we think that this is pointing to uh, the development of the microbiota as this shared aspect of human development. And so, so overall, I've shown you that um, there's a similar pattern of microbiota assembly in healthy children. Uh, so next, I wanted to shift to children that are undernourished. Uh, so I looked at a cohort of Bangladeshi children treated for severe acute malnutrition. And so these are children that have severe wasting, so they're very underweight for their height. Uh, and the definition is that they have a weight for height z-score, three standard deviations below the mean, so they're, they're uh, very underweight for their height. Uh, so I followed these children um, that were treated for severe acute malnutrition, or SAM, um, with existing therapeutic foods that were not at all designed to target the gut microbiota. So I wanted to see how their microbiota compared to healthy children, and I was also wanted to get a, a glimpse into how their biological state was changing over time uh, from this severely malnourished period through treatment and then through follow-up. So for this study, we followed 54 children that were treated for SAM. Uh, they were enrolled in the study, and they underwent a, a several-day stabilization period where they were given <coughs> antibiotics and uh, rehydrated. 
And then the children were given a therapeutic food uh, to help them gain weight and recover from severe acute malnutrition. And this lasted for, uh, this therapeutic food lasted for about a week to several weeks until each child gained the, the clinically defined amount of weight. So until they no longer were considered to have severe acute malnutrition. And so to look at the, the microbiota over time, um, we had fecal samples that were collected uh, right at enrollment, so when these children are very severely malnourished, uh, throughout the therapeutic uh, feeding, and then uh, over this period of one year uh, follow-up. We had fecal samples taken every month or every two months. Uh, at the same time, we also had blood samples collected from these children, uh, so we could get uh, a better glimpse of the, as what was happening um, biologically from the period of severe malnutrition to partial recovery and then uh, six months after being discharged from the study. So we find that these children treated for SAM, uh, even though they clinically recover from SAM, they still remain underweight and stunted. Um, so on the left here, I'm showing you their weight for height Z scores. Uh, so just as a reminder, zero is normal. Uh, so anything below zero means you're underweight for your height. Uh, and this red zone represents children that are uh, considered to have severe acute malnutrition. Uh, so you can see at the beginning of the study, at admission, uh, most of these children have severe acute malnutrition, which you're treated for. And there is some improvement by the time you get to discharge. But after discharge, there's really not much improvement in their weight for height Z score. Uh, so many of these children, even though they've clinically recovered and were allowed to go home, um, they still have what we call moderate acute malnutrition, um, which is a, a less severe form of malnutrition, but, um, but still they have this persistent malnutrition. Then when we look at height for age z-score, uh, which is a metric of linear growth, we see that these children uh, come into the study very stunted, um, and then really their, their height for age z-score doesn't increase throughout the study or throughout this one year follow-up period. So they, they come in stunted and they remain stunted. Uh, so this therapeutic food really is not, not helping them achieve the desired linear growth. Next, we wanted to look at the microbiota of these children uh, and compare them to healthy. So we already know they, they're not growing like they should. What does their microbiota look like? So we have this metric called the microbiota for age z-score, and we can take our random forest model of microbiota maturation and apply it to these undernourished children. And so the random forest model gives us a prediction of the microbiota age. So for example, if we have this child that is actually 18 months old, um, but their microbiota looks like an eight-month-old child. So they have uh, this, oh, they have bacterial taxa looking like a normal, healthy eight-month-old child. This child would be considered to have an immature microbiota, so it would have a, a very negative microbiota for HC score. And so when we look at all these children, we see that uh, when we calculate the microbiota for HC scores, we see, not surprisingly, that admission they have very immature microbiota, um, which really doesn't improve much by discharge, but one month post-discharge, there's some improvement. But after this point, there's really not much more improvement in their microbiota for HC score. Uh, so throughout this one-year follow-up period, they still have <coughs> a very immature microbiota. And this echoes the, the lack of recovery in their weight for height z-score. So not only do they have, not only are they underweight, but they also have this immature microbiota, persistent microbiota immaturity. So, um, so to get a closer look at what is actually happening to these children, to try and get an idea of why they're not fully recovering, um, we decided to do targeted mass spectrometry-based plasma metabolomics to see how their metabolism was changing from the severely malnourished state to discharge, partial recovery, and then six months follow-up. So what we found is that 
when these children are presenting with severe malnutrition, um, they're exhibiting what we call rampant lipolysis. Uh, so what we see here, um, here I'm showing you non-esterified fatty acids, uh, which are the substrate for fatty acid oxidation, and then acyl carnitines and ketones, uh, which are produced during uh, fatty acid oxidation. Um, we see all of these metabolites have significantly elevated levels at admission, so when these children are severely malnourished, um, and then this decreases with treatment and seems to continue to decrease uh, six months after treatment. And so, uh, so we think this means that during the severely malnourished state, um, children are using up every last bit of diminishing fat stores they have. They're in this catabolic state where they're using their own body tissues for energy. Um, but it looks like this, this particular um, aspect of their metabolism shows some improvement that is sustained six months uh, follow up. So there's a significant decrease in levels of these metabolites that are a signature for fatty acid oxidation. However, when we look at uh, amino acids in the serum, there's a little bit of a different story. So we see an increase in most amino acids with treatment, including the branch chain amino acids. Um, and there's also an increase in C3 acyl carnitine, which is a product of branch chain amino acid oxidation. So it looks like there's a switch from beta oxidation of, uh, of these children's adipose tissue of their fat stores to amino acid oxidation, where they're breaking down amino acids from the therapeutic food. Uh, so they're switching from a more catabolic state to a more anabolic state with the therapeutic food. Uh, however, when we look at the, this B3 time point, so six months post-discharge, we see that the levels of these branched-chain amino acids and also the C3 acyl carnitine drop to close to pretreatment levels. Um, so while we see that with the beta oxidation, there is some recovery, um, as far as the amino acids, we see that there's um, an incomplete recovery. So the, these children have lower levels of amino acids. And this is really important because branch chain amino acids activate mTOR, um, which is an important signaling pathway for growth. Um, and so, so this could partially explain why these children aren't fully recovering uh, from this period of severe malnutrition. So to look even deeper into the biological state of these children, uh, we performed quantitative plasma proteomics. Um, and so we used a platform called SOMASCAN, uh, which consists of these modified nucleotide aptamers that specifically bind to soluble proteins. Uh, so with SOMASCAN, we can measure over 1,300 proteins. And these proteins represent a wide range of biomarkers um, that are mediators of host metabolism, physiology, and immune function, and neurodevelopment. There's a really wide dynamic range, so we can detect very abundant proteins um, to very low abundant proteins. And there's a high sensitivity and specificity. To begin to identify biomarkers of biological state, we can correlate these plasma protein levels with anthropometry, um, plasma metabolites, and features of the microbiota. Uh, because we, in addition to quantitative plasma proteomics at these three time points, uh, we also have fecal samples that were taken at the same time. So we can begin to correlate the, the microbiota with levels of these plasma proteins. So in this cohort of children treated for severe acute malnutrition, we see a significant correlation between weight for height z-score, uh, which is this increase in weight, and plasma proteins. So here I'm showing you the plasma proteins that are either most sig significantly positively correlated with the weight for height z-score, or most significantly negatively correlated with the weight for height z-score. So when we focus on the, the proteins that positively correlate with growth, um, we see this growth hormone receptor, and we also see growth hormone responsive biomarker, biomarkers, uh, such as lumican, fibronectin, extracellular matrix protein one. Uh, so these are all important extracellular matrix proteins that are important for, uh, 
for growth and development. When we look at the plasma proteins that are negatively correlated with weight for height C score, we see here insulin-like growth factor binding protein 2, uh, which can bind to IGF-1 um, and prevent it from binding to its receptor. So IGF-1 is, is, is another very important growth signaling pathway. We also see uh, plasma proteins <coughs> indicative of inflammation that are negatively correlated with weight for height Z-score. Uh, so interferon alpha-7, C-reactive protein, angiotensinogen. So overall, ponderal growth, or increase in weight, is associated with recovery from severe acute malnutrition and associated with upregulation of growth hormone signaling and a reduction in markers of systemic inflammation. Uh, so overall, we find that children with severe acute malnutrition, when they're in this severely malnourished state, um, have impaired uh, growth hormone and IGF-1 signaling. So we can also look at the at levels of metabolites. Um, so these ketones, non-esterified fatty acids, branched-chain amino acids, uh, and correlate them with levels of these plasma proteins. So if you remember, uh, ketones and non-esterified fatty acids are very high in the severely malnourished state. And so we see in the severely malnourished state, um, we see lower levels of this growth hormone binding protein. And so lower levels of this protein mean that, um, mean that this growth hormone binding protein is less able to bind to growth hormone, uh, which normally helps it bind to its receptor and leads to downstream signaling. Uh, in the severely malnourished state, we also see very high levels of IGF binding protein 2, um, which binds to IGF-1 and sequesters it, uh, preventing it from binding to its receptor. In the malnourished state, we also see very high levels of stanocalcin-1. Uh, so normally, papillicin breaks down this IGF binding protein and, and releases IGF-1 so it can bind to its receptor. But in the malnourished state, we have high levels of the inhibitor of papillicin. Um, so we have higher levels of IGF binding protein, um, which prevents IGF-1 from binding to its receptor. On the other hand, in the, in the refed state, uh, in these children with malnutrition, we see uh, higher levels of this growth hormone binding protein, uh, which is associated with an increase in growth. And so, uh, so not surprisingly, you see higher levels of growth hormone signaling, and you see higher levels of growth hormone responsive genes uh, in target <coughs> tissues. At the same time, we see higher levels of papillicin A. Uh, so papillicin A is able to degrade IGF binding protein 2. Uh, so more IGF-1 is released and able to bind to its receptor and lead to downstream signaling, uh, which leads to this growth state. In addition, we see correlations between these markers of growth and age discriminatory bacterial taxa. Um, and we thought this was especially interesting. So at this point, we wanted to interrogate the, the interaction between the gut microbiota and host biology. Uh, so to do this, we compared the metabolic capabilities of gut microbiomes of healthy and undernourished individuals. So we had healthy children uh, that were sampled from zero to three years every month, and then the same group of children with severe acute malnutrition. So we performed shotgun metagenomic sequencing of these gut microbiomes, and we annotated the genes in their microbiomes using MCC, um, which annotates pathways uh, related to bacterial metabolism. So amino acid metabolism, carbohydrate, carbohydrate breakdown, uh, fermentation, and also uh, B vitamin synthesis. Uh, so, so again, uh, to understand how these microbial pathways, these microbial metabolic pathways are changing over time, um, we wanted to focus on healthy children, the microbiomes of healthy children. And so similar to our models of microbiota development, we were able to develop a model of um, microbiome development. 
So here I'm showing you the age discriminatory bacterial metabolic pathways. Uh, so these are all the, the bacterial metabolic pathways that are age discriminatory again. Um, so some pathways are increasing in abundance over time. Some pathways are decreasing in abundance over time. Um, but overall, we can see that there's this normal pattern uh, of microbiome development in healthy children. So when we apply the model to a separate test set of healthy Bangladeshi individuals, um, we get a good prediction of functional microbiome age. So again, a, a strong correlation between the chronological age of the child and the predicted functional microbiome age. Okay, so now when we look at individuals that were treated for severe acute malnutrition, uh, we see many significant differences between the microbiomes of healthy children and the microbiomes of undernourished children. So here I'm showing you the, the top 30 age discriminatory microbial metabolic pathways. Um, and I'm showing you the difference between healthy children, the difference between the pathway representation in healthy children uh, versus children with children that are treated for severe acute malnutrition. And so here I'm showing you both enrollment and then six months post-discharge. And all of the pathways in red are significantly different between healthy children and undernourished children. So you can see there are a lot of differences, uh, both at enrollment, but also six months post-discharge. So there's really not much improvement in the, the microbiome maturity of these children. Uh, and interestingly, you see a lot of pathways evolved in amino acid biosynthesis. Uh, and specifically, six months post-discharge, um, you see children that are undernourished or treated for severe acute malnutrition uh, have significantly reduced levels in this branched chain amino acid biosynthesis pathway. So overall, by comparing healthy children to children treated for severe acute malnutrition, uh, we can see that undernourished children have restricted growth, they have low branched chain amino acids in their plasma, they have reduced IGF-1 and growth hormone signaling, and then when we look at their microbiota, they have immature microbiota um, compared to healthy children, and they also have persistent functional microbiome immaturity. And so now that we know what the problem is, um, the goal is to try and fix the problem. So, so how can we take these children with functional microbiome maturity that aren't growing well and try and get them back on track to, to a healthy state, a mature microbiota and a, a healthy growth state? Uh, so to do this, we turn to our notobiotic mouse models. So a, a former graduate student in the lab, Laura Blanton, uh, provided early preclinical evidence that the microbiota that microbiota immaturity is causally related to undernutrition. Uh, so Laura took the <coughs> microbiota from healthy children uh, and children that were stunted, and these children were the same age, uh, and she, she colonized mice uh, with these microbiota. So these mice were recently weaned, actively growing, um, and she fed the mice the same deficient diet. Um, and so, so you can see here that uh, transplanting these discordant microbiota into mice led to discordant growth phenotypes. So uh, the mice given the, uh, the stunted microbiota exhibited growth faltering when compared to the healthy, the mice given the healthy microbiota. And this is, since the mice were fed the same diet, we know that this is due to uh, the microbiota they were given. And so the, the stunted microbiota transmitted this impaired growth, also impaired metabolism um, and alterations in bone growth. And Laura was also able to correlate the, the representation of bacterial taxa in the microbiota of these mice with their growth phenotypes. And she identified a subset of age discriminatory bacterial taxa that are actually growth discriminatory. So now we know that the gut microbiota is causally related to undernutrition. And we also have these bacterial targets uh, that we think are important for growth. So our next question is, how can we actually repair gut microbiota immaturity? And so to begin with, we started with the, the least invasive method possible. 
Uh, so we looked at the complementary foods that are commonly eaten by children in Bangladesh uh, when they're first weaning. And so we looked at uh, these 12 different ingredients um, to see, uh, and we screened these ingredients for their ability to increase the representation of age discriminatory bacterial taxa. Uh, and so for this experiment, uh, this was led by a postdoc in the lab, Sid Venkatesh. Um, we colonized mice with uh, bacterial taxa derived from healthy Bangladeshi children and also children with severe acute malnutrition. Uh, and so we colonized mice with a defined consortium of bacteria consisting of weaning phase age discriminatory bacteria, uh, the younger milk phase age discriminatory bacteria, and also uh, bacterial strains derived from children with severe acute malnutrition. And uh, we fed these mice combinations of these 12 different uh, complementary food ingredients. And so doing this um, and replicating this experiment, um, we were able to find significant associations between these bacterial taxa and the levels of the ingredients in the diets. And so we found that there were four ingredients in particular uh, that were most significantly positively correlated with our weaning phase age discriminatory taxa. Um, but at the same time, importantly, they didn't increase the abundance of the, the SAM-derived strains. Uh, so they, they increased the abundance of, the, uh, of our target age discriminatory strains without negative off-target effects. And so, so we can see that in this defined consortium, uh, we're able to use specific food ingredients to increase the relative abundance of target taxa. So next I wanted to ask whether these candidate ingredients could increase the representation of these target strains in a more complex microbiota community. And so I colonized mice with uh, a representative post-SAM-MAM donor microbiota. And so to remind you, this is a, uh, this, uh, the sample was taken from a child that was treated for severe acute malnutrition uh, and then was followed up uh, after discharge, but remained in this somewhat malnourished state. So this child had moderate malnutrition. Um, and this child also had a, an immature microbiota. And, um, and so we, we colonized mice with this intact uh, microbiota from the donor and then fed the mice one of three diets uh, and so here we were testing our, uh, our target candidate uh, complementary foods that in previous screens were shown to have beneficial effects on our weaning phase age discriminatory taxa. Um, so here we're testing peanut flour uh, and then this diet we're testing our uh, four of our wheat ingredients. And so you'll recognize uh, peanut, chickpea flour, and banana uh, from the previous screen. Um, in a second screen, we wanted to replace tilapia um, because we thought it wouldn't be well accepted by children and it's difficult to manufacture into a, a therapeutic food. Uh, so in a second screen, we identified soy flour as having um, a beneficial effect on these target weaning phase age discriminatory strains. And so the, the control diet in this experiment I called Mirpur 18. And so this is representative of what a child in Bangladesh uh, would normally consume. So it's a rice and lentil based diet. And then my two experimental diets are this Mirapur 18 either supplemented with one of our target ingredients uh, or all four of these uh, lead candidate ingredients. I also had germ free controls um, that were fed one of these three diets as well. Uh, so then I was able to tease out what are the diet only effects versus what are the microbiota effects. And so I looked at the effect of, the, of these microbiota directed diets on my, the microbiota community structure, uh, the microbial metabolic activity, so fecal metabolites, and also microbial RNA seq. And then I also looked at the host response. Uh, so we did RNA seq of the intestinal mucosa in these mice. Uh, so we find that the supplemented diets do have a uh, beneficial effect uh, and actually hit our targeted strains. 
So you can see that uh, here I'm showing you the percent relative abundance uh, of this weaning phase, important weaning phase age discriminatory strain. And you can see that in green, the four ingredient supplemented diet significantly, in significantly increases the relative abundance of this target older weaning phase strain. At the same time, the, the four ingredient diet significantly decreases the level of uh, an early, younger age discriminatory strain. So overall, the supplemented diets are having a, um, an effect on the microbiota where they're shifting the microbiota to a more mature state. We also performed RNA-seq to look at um, the, the bacterial transcriptome, and, and we can see what functions these bacteria are having in the gut uh, in a, a diet-dependent way. Um, and so interestingly, we see that the supplemented diets have a significant impact on microbial gene expression. Uh, so we see increased expression in some carbohydrate utilization pathways, um, which is also reflected in the increased levels of short-chain fatty acids, uh, which are the, the, final project, the final products of carbohydrate fermentation. Uh, and interestingly, we see a significant increase in some of the amino acid biosynthetic pathways. Uh, so importantly, branch chain amino acids, uh, expression is significantly increased on the supplemented diet. Um, also, we see increase in methionine, threonine biosynthesis. And lastly, we looked at, um, at the host responses. So we did RNA-seq of the uh, laser capture, laser capture microdissected uh, small intestinal mucosa. Uh, so this is the, uh, the section of the small intestine in contact with the gut microbiota. And we saw diet and colonization dependent increases in expression of genes and gene ontology pathways involved in coherent binding and cell adhesion. So the supplemented diets increase these markers of uh, gut barrier function. So we saw these beneficial effects in the uh, notobiotic mice. So next we wanted to move to a second host species that is more similar to humans and test our lead MDCF prototypes uh, in notobiotic piglets. So we tested two isochloric diets. Um, one of the diets contained uh, four of our microbiota, lead microbiota directed ingredients, and the other diet contained just two of the microbiota directed ingredients. Um, and so once these piglets were weaned, uh, they were given one of these two diets. And you can see that the, the piglets given the four ingredient diet exhibited uh, increased growth when compared to the piglets given the two ingredient diet. This was also seen in uh, cortical bone mass, uh, which is an important metric of linear growth. Um, so these piglets are gaining more weight and also showing signs of increased linear growth. And on top of these increases in, in growth in the piglets, uh, we saw significant changes in their gut microbiotas. Um, so in the, the piglets consuming the four ingredient microbiota directed diet, we saw significant increases in levels of many of these age and growth discriminatory bacterial strains in the microbiota of these piglets. And so, uh, so we had the, this positive evidence from our preclinical mouse models. Also, the, uh, we saw this increase in growth in notobiotic piglets. Uh, so our, our final test was to return to the human population uh, that was the, the origin of these studies. And we wanted to see if the results from our preclinical notobiotic animal models translated to undernourished children. So we did a, a controlled feeding study. So this was a, a randomized controlled trial. Um, and we, uh, we recruited a cohort of children with moderate acute malnutrition. Um, and these children were fed one of four diets. Uh, so one of the diets is this ready-to-use supplementary food, RUSF, uh, which is um, right now given to children in Bangladesh to treat moderate acute malnutrition. So this is sort of the standard right now. And um, this is mostly rice and lentil-based. 
And then the three experimental diets were our microbiota directed uh, foods. And so these, uh, these three diets contained different amounts of our four lead ingredients. Uh, so MDCF1 and MDCF2 um, both contain all four target ingredients. Um, although MDCF2 has higher amounts uh, because it lacks milk powder. And then MDCF3 only contains two of the, the lead microbiota directed ingredients, similar to the, the two ingredient diet used in the pig study. And so, uh, so with this experiment, uh, with this study, these children were fed um, the therapeutic food for four weeks. And we also had a, a run-in phase and a post-intervention phase. And so, uh, so there was actually no significant difference in the amount of weight these children gained. Um, so they all increased weight throughout the study, uh, independent of which food they were consuming. Uh, however, we did see with the microbiota-directed complementary food 2, MDCF2, there was a significant increase in plasma IGF-1, uh, which correlated with plasma bright chain amino acids. So you can see here in this graph, I'm showing you um, the levels of IGF-1 in the plasma of these children before treatment and after treatment. And so MECF-2 elicited this increase in IGF-1. Um, and you can see it, the increases um, are approaching the levels in, in healthy children. And we also saw this positive correlation between levels of IGF-1 and plasma branch chain amino acids. And so to remind you, MDCF2 was the, the diet that contained all four um, lead microbiota directed ingredients and also lacked milk powder when compared to MDCF1. To take a, a deeper look into the biology of these children and the effects of microbiota directed complementary food too, um, and the other microbiota-directed complementary foods. We took a look at the, the plasma proteomes. Um, so we did the same quantitative proteomics, as I mentioned, for the, the SAM study. And uh, as a comparison, we looked at, uh, we also performed quantitative proteomics on healthy children and also children with SAM, severe acute malnutrition. And, um, and so, here on the left, I'm showing you all of the, uh, the top 50 plasma proteins that are discriminatory for healthy. Um, so this is based on the full change difference between healthy children and children with SAM. So all these proteins are, are more highly abundant in healthy children, um, whereas these proteins on the right are discriminatory for children with SAM. So they're more highly abundant in children with SAM. And I hope you can appreciate that uh, I'm showing you in bold here, MDCF2. Uh, MDCF2 alone is actually increasing the levels of all of these healthy discriminatory proteins. Um, and then on, uh, on the SAM discriminatory proteins, MDCF2 is significantly decreasing levels of the SAM discriminatory proteins. So overall, uh, MDCF2 is shifting the plasma proteome of these children to a state resembling healthy children. So if we take a closer look at the proteins that are, that are changing because of MDCF2, we see proteins we would expect uh, related to growth, also related to inflammation. Uh, so I'm just gonna focus on, on two aspects um, that were of particular interest. So, so when, when we look at all of the proteins that are, uh, that are changing with MDCF2 treatment in these children, we saw, um, we saw a high representation of proteins that were increasing that were related to bone growth, specifically osteoblast differentiation and maturation. And so here I'm showing you the, um, these proteins related to bone growth. And you can see MDCF2 is increasing levels of all of these proteins. So for example, um, we see increases in bone morphogenic protein 7, uh, efferin, sonic hedgehog, and these are all important for osteoblast differentiation. So going from a stem cell uh, to a more differentiated osteoblast, which is the cell that's responsible for building bone. 
We also see increases specifically with MDCF2 in levels of these proteins, um, metallopeptidases, and also bone morphogenic protein 1. Uh, so these proteins are important for preparing collagen, um, which then leads to uh, downstream bone formation. And then we also see significant increases in proteins like osteopontin and bone sialoprotein 2. Uh, and these are important for uh, bone formation and mineralization, so later stages of bone development. Um, so we think this is, we think these effects on uh, bone formation are really important considering that one of the serious long-term effects of undernutrition is stunting, this, this lack of linear growth. Another interesting uh, effect of MDCF2 was that it increased markers of central nervous system development. Um, and so again, we looked at all the proteins that were affected by MDCF2. Uh, and we found that there was a high representation of proteins in, involved in central nervous system development. Um, so for example, we see um, proteins that are, we see an increase in proteins that are important for neuronal differentiation and survival. You know, so going from this um, undifferentiated precursor cell to a, a differentiated neuron, which is very important for, um, for central nervous system development. Uh, we also see increase in proteins important for cell proliferation, migration, and neurite outgrowth. And finally, we see increases with MDCF2 treatment of uh, semaphorins and their receptor, and also the netrin receptor. And these are all important for axonal guidance, um, so helping neurons make proper connections and form synapses, which again is very important for proper central nervous system development. And so, so we think these central nervous system increases in central nervous system proteins uh, is also very interesting and important because again, one of the, the long-term effects of undernutrition um, is this uh, deficient cognitive function. So if we can increase levels of these proteins, uh, maybe we can see improvement in these long-term outcomes. So in addition to these positive effects on host biology, MDCF2 also shifted the gut microbiota to a more mature configuration. Uh, so we saw MDCF2 alone uh, led to significant decreases in this early age discriminatory, age discriminatory bacterial strain, um, B. longo. And, and we also saw MDCF2 led to significant increases in levels of these older age discriminatory bacterial strains. Um, so this study led us to uh, view the microbiota in, in different ways. Um, so there was a fellow in the lab, Arjun, uh, who developed a new way of looking at microbiota assembly. Um, and he found uh, using methods of statistical covariance, uh, he found 15 bacterial taxa that co-vary in healthy Bangladeshi children. And looking at these, 15 bacterial taxa alone, uh, which he termed the eco group, um, gave, uh, was sufficient to describe the state of the microbiota. And so when we look at just these 15 eco group taxa in first healthy Bangladeshi kids, uh, we see that there's a, a significant separation of younger children and older children. And then when we look at these 15 ecogroup taxa in uh, children treated for SAM um, with these four therapeutic foods, we see that MDCF2 alone, which is in brown, uh, significantly shifts the gut microbiota of these children to a more mature state when compared to the other diets. So in conclusion, I've showed you that undernourished children have persistent abnormalities that are not repaired by existing therapeutic foods. Our preclinical models, uh, in our preclinical models, microbiota-directed therapeutic foods showed promise in both repairing microbiota immaturity and increasing markers of growth, um, both in our mice and in our piglets. And also the results from these preclinical models translated to humans. So for future directions, um, we have both human studies and preclinical studies we're interested in. 
Uh, so first we want to test this lead microbiota directed complementary <coughs> food, MBCF2, versus the control, RUSF, with greater numbers of children with moderate acute malnutrition and also a more severe form of malnutrition, the post-SAM man. So children treated for severe acute malnutrition uh, that still have uh, persistent undernutrition. We also want to increase follow-up periods in these children to determine how changes in the mechanistic biomarkers relate to clinically relevant responses. For example, um, if we see an, an increase in growth hormone binding protein, at what point do we see an increase in, in weight for height z-score, for example? We also want to continue our preclinical studies. Um, so we'd like to identify the bioactive components in the microbiota-directed foods. Uh, we want to know why MDCF2 seemed to have this positive effect when, for example, MDCF1 did not. We want to elucidate the mechanism of bioactive components on the targeted strains, and then in turn their effects on the host. Um, so for example, if a, a certain bacterial strain is using a metabolite, what is that metabolite being transformed into, and, and what effect does that transformed metabolite have on the host, and how does that increase growth? We also want to colonize notobiotic animals with defined consortia to delineate the effects of the, the therapeutic foods on certain strains, uh, and then again, in turn, their effects on the host. Okay, so um, I just want to thank uh, a lot of people. This is a, a very collaborative project and would be impossible without many, many people. Um, so first, I want to thank the, the Gordon Lab. I want to thank Jeff for, uh, for providing such a great lab environment. Um, specifically for this project, I want to thank uh, Sid, who performed the diet oscillation experiments and has been a close collaborator and involved in this project the whole way. Um, Howei, who is the, the master of the piglet experiments um, and spent countless hours uh, working on with the piglets and also is a, a very important collaborator on this project. Satish uh, was my mentor when I first joined the lab, so, um, so he was really instrumental in teaching me how to do random forests and uh, a lot of that initial analysis. Uh, I want to thank Matt for his expertise in RNA-seq, uh, helping with that, and then all of this uh, metagenomic sequencing and um, an analysis of the human data. I want to thank Vanderleen for, uh, for looking at the, uh, the host side of the mass experiment, doing the RNA-seq of the, the small intestine, the laser capture microdissection, uh, and all the pathology of that. Um, Robert Chen um, did a lot of the, uh, the SOMA scan uh, quantitative proteomics analysis for our human trial. Um, Arjun developed this new model of microbiota assembly using the eco group, uh, which really helped us see how, uh, how our microbiota directed complementary foods were shifting the microbiota. Uh, and also Mike Barrett for, uh, for helping to organize the, these human trials and being really instrumental in that and, uh, and dealing with a lot of the analysis and interpretation. Uh, <clears throat> I want to thank the rest of the Gordon Lab. Um, Stephanie for uh, keeping everyone in line and helping organize things. Uh, Sabrina for being the best lab manager and making sure everything runs smoothly. Um, Janaki for helping culture all these bacterial strains and um, being there for discussion and everything. Um, and everyone else, uh, everyone else in the lab has helped at some point, um, even if I've forgotten to specifically mention um, and of course, David Maria for, uh, for helping with the mouse experiments, even when there are crazy numbers of mice and complicated procedures. Um, I want to thank uh, Jess and Maria for sequencing, uh, Eric and Brian for running our um, computing cluster and, and dealing with my cleanup when I accidentally generated 30 million files and broke a record. Um, Richard Head at GTAC for helping with the, the SOMA scan analysis. 
uh, Tamid at ICD DRB in Bangladesh, who, uh, who we collaborate with heavily, and, um, and we would not have access to a human population or be able to do these trials without him. Uh, and Chris Newgard at Duke for, um, for doing a lot of our metabolomics analysis and helping with interpretation. Uh, I want to thank my thesis committee, Dan Goldberg, Scott Holkren, Laura Iannotti, Rob Mitra, Clay Semenkovich, uh, for their help in, um, in helping ask critical questions and, uh, and developing my project. Uh, and lastly, I want to thank uh, my funding sources, especially Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, um, which provides the bulk of the funding for this project. And I'd be happy to take any questions. with the, uh, the beginning of eating solid foods. So the transition from exclusive breastfeeding to, to starting to eat solid foods. Because at that point, um, studies, have looked, studies have followed um, the microbiota of a single individual and you know, looked at high resolution, like on this day, this child began eating this thing. And, and we see that uh, that definitely corresponds with, um, with introdu introduction of solid foods. And then, so in your intervention, do those healthy kids already eat more of those foods? Like you adding like chickpea, bananas, do they already eat more of that? That's why. Um. Earlier, or yeah. I I can't really answer that. Um, so we have we do have uh, diet recall data, but I haven't thoroughly analyzed that as far as you know what exactly children are eating at certain time points. Um, but yeah, that's that's definitely something we would like to know more about. You know, do healthy children have very different diets from undernourished children? So, when children are treated for SAM, are they are they necessarily expected to like catch up to like healthier children? Because it seems like they stop treatment when they're definitely not close to being like a healthy um, weight yet. Do you know what happens to them after they complete treatment? Um, so the, the criteria for being released um, is that they have to have a weight for height Z score above minus two. Um, so uh, a WHZ score of minus two uh, to minus three is this like moderate acute malnutrition period. So they just have to be considered not malnourished, which is above this minus two. But really they're still they're still malnourished, um, but I think it's just impractical for children to, you know, remain in the hospital and uh, parents have to be there. And um, so it's just to to get them healthy enough, they think to um, to go home. But yeah, I mean, we see these kids definitely still have persistent undernutrition, um, so it's definitely something we want to target. Get another question. Uh, maybe I'm oversimplifying this too much. Pretty naive way of thinking, but when you treat Sam, um, I was wondering, is it the gain of good bacteria that's more important, or is it the loss of the bad bacteria? Um, yeah, that's a very good question. Um, there have been studies that, uh, so right now, the the standard treatment for um, for Sam is they're given antibiotics during this stabilization phase. So, so every kid with SAM is treated with antibiotics, um, and we still don't see recover, like full recovery. So I think, I think it's probably a combination, but, um, but you know, if we're getting rid of everything that's bad or potentially pathogenic, um, but we still don't see recovery, then I think that points to, you know, okay, maybe we're missing something. Time for another question. Removing milk or milk from the diet, 
to make the microbiome look like that of a weaned child? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so we see in the, in the human study, um, the main difference between those two diets was the removal of milk powder. But at the same time, we also had increases in levels of our, uh, of our four target ingredients. Uh, so it's kind of hard to, to tease apart, you know, what is the effect of removing milk powder versus increasing these other ingredients. So I think we'll have to, you know, we'll have to go back to our mass studies and um, sort of re-enroll the, um, you know, recapitulate the, the trial in mice, and, and then we can really ask those questions. Okay. Um, with that, uh, thank you for your attention, and uh, thank you, Jeanette. I, I still have no idea how he keeps track of everyone's project and, um, and keeps track of all these collaborations. Uh, it kind of blows my mind, but I feel very fortunate to have been in this lab environment. Um, and gotten the opportunity to work on such an interesting project. I want to thank my lab for uh, being such a great lab, both within the lab and outside of the lab. Um, you know, sometimes we accidentally match, uh, sometimes we <laughs> match on purpose, but uh, it's always a good place to be. Sometimes we go a little crazy, um, but but overall, it's uh, it's a great lab environment, and I feel really really fortunate to to be in the lab. Uh, I want to thank the genetics program, uh, DBBS, for being, well now we're the, the number one program in genetics, apparently, uh, and I can see why. Uh, I want to thank Jim especially for being the best program director. Um, you know, he's spent countless hours uh, helping me with presentations, including this one, you know, going slide by slide. Um, he does everything he can to, to help students. Um, and I feel fortunate to be in a program where we're allowed to dress up for, <laughs> for talks at retreats. Um, and, and we really are like a, a family. <laughs> I want to thank um, my three best friends here. Um, we call ourselves Slurge. <laughs> it's our first initials. We even got rings. Um, but they, they have really helped to make grad school the best time of my life so far. Um, and you can see we, we always have a fun time together. Yeah, so sometimes in grad school you can find yourself in a rut. You know, you feel like your research isn't going well, you're not really going anywhere. But you just have to remember that you have friends with you. And you can always figure out a way to get out of that rut and move on. I'm thankful for many other friends I've met along the way. Um, Bahavna, who has been a great friend and um, joined our Zumba crew. Uh, um, we've gone on fun trips together. I uh, want to thank Bo. Um, together we organized the, uh, with Shohini, of course, the 25th anniversary gala. Um, and just all these ladies that have been uh, great to have along my side uh, this whole way. Uh, I want to thank all my other friends, um, you know, from, uh, from uh, potlucks to crazy Halloween costumes and uh, even more costumes. Um, it's, it's been fun to have such a great group of friends uh, to share graduate school with. I want to thank my friends that, uh, that are old friends and will be lifelong friends. Uh, my friend, best friend Jamie from college, uh, who's gone through med school as I've gone through graduate school. Uh, my best friend Anne, uh, who I've known since fifth grade and, uh, and we've been through so much together. Uh, and she appreciates my, my serious love of food as well. Uh, and, and my friend Ashley, who uh, has been my friend since we were eight or nine. Um, I want to thank my family. Um, I feel so fortunate to have what I think is the best family. Uh, they're so supportive. Um, 
my mom, my dad, and my brother Andrew, and my new sister-in-law, Laura. Um, you know, they just care so much about me and are always so supportive and, and want the best for me. I couldn't ask for anything more. I want to thank Ian, my soon-to-be husband, who has been my number one supporter through this journey. Uh, thank you for being my sun and moon. <laughs> We've traveled the world together. You've introduced me to your love of water. Uh, we've explored our love for gardening together, uh, you know, from farm to table, from cooking fresh meals. You fit well with my family, uh, and uh, you're my co-scientist, and, and you always help me up when I'm down, so thank you. Okay, thank you everyone. Thank you. <laughs>